Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. By my count, this is episode number 632. My name is Camden Busey. I'm back in the studio. Uh, I've been doing a lot of recording lately, and uh, some of these episodes are a little bit out of order, so that's atypical for us. Almost always they come in order and are released in order. Uh, But we got back from a trip out to California and we're going to have a whole host of uh, episodes coming out uh, shortly. Uh, I'll let my past self, which to you is your future self, uh, explain <laughs> explain it uh, next week. Fun episode next week with uh, David Van Drunen on a forthcoming book. So stay tuned for that. But uh, it is uh, I'm recording Thursday, February 6th, 2020. And uh, this episode, um, if all goes well technologically... And uh, with the internet, should be released February 7th. Uh, It is, for me, tomorrow, 2020. And uh, today we have with us Dr. Lane Tipton, who's our fellow of Biblical and Systematic Theology. We're going to be speaking about Voss Group, hence trying to stick to our schedule, why uh, some of these episodes are coming out of order. So here for 632, we're back to Voss Group, first episode of the month. Welcome back, Lane. It's good to see you. Good to speak with you. Great to be here, as always, Camden. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to speaking. Uh, we are going to be talking about Voss, but as much as we're trying to stick with the schedule and do everything properly, decently, and in order, we're going to be speaking about uh, not from Voss's biblical theology, uh, but from uh, his collection of sermons, Grace and Glory. Uh, we're going to be speaking about a very well-known, uh, at least to Vossians, and uh, famous, I should say, sermon that he delivered number four in the collection, titled Rabboni. And uh, the the text that is referenced is John chapter 20, verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turneth herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but before we uh, open up to grace and glory, maybe talk about uh, the collection of sermons here more generally first. I do have uh, several things to mention. Of course, we want you to visit us online at reformedforum.org. If you head on over there, uh, you'll see a bunch of uh, um, recent episodes and as well as some recent essays. Uh, Dan Ragusa has a a good essay on on, uh, minimalism posted. Jim Cassidy recently wrote about uh, Schleiermacher and the spirit of liberalism. And so there's there's, uh, some new writing there and and, uh, more to come in the future. Uh, and we also want you to be aware of some some future changes. We've been hard at work uh, developing uh, some course materials, uh, video series, that sort of thing. And uh, I've been working also uh, when I have the opportunity to uh, work on some of the features of the website. So hopefully reformedforum.org will be refreshed in the next couple of months and we'll have some really exciting new features. If you've got any questions about that or suggestions, you know, you can Fire off an email at mail at reformedforum.org or call us up. You can leave a voicemail uh, on the office number. Uh, I don't have it memorized entirely yet. I think it's 847-986-6140. You can call that number and see who you get. Yeah, you might get me. Um, and uh, I'll pick up if uh, if it's not a spammer and uh, we can talk about stuff. So we're I'm very encouraged as we're you know now in the second month of a new year. Uh, by the progress and the way things are going here at Reformed Forum. Been very excited and uh, delighted to uh, to continue this labor, and we hope you are too. So if so, you know, get in touch with us. Let us know how we could be of service to you and to your church, and, uh, and um, encourage us on that front. So thanks so much. Well, Lane, let's talk a bit about uh, Grace and Glory, uh, a really important uh, collection of sermons. We should mention, if I'm not mistaken, Voss did not serve, uh, certainly not, for the most of his life, did not serve as a pastor. Uh, but the right. sermons that he did deliver and write were often preached at the Princeton Chapel, correct? And then yes, these are correct. collected now into this uh, this book. There's a couple versions of this. I've got this one here for Banner of Truth. Uh, I've got another one here. Some people might have seen this as paperback one by Solid mm. Ground Christian Books. It's got a little bit of an introduction by Scott Clark. Um, oh, Scott Clark. I yeah. haven't read that intro. <laughs> Just saw Scott. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm, I haven't done a line-by-line uh, looking at this, but I th- I don't know if all the sermons are in here. There's only six yeah, in, the, in the paperback. I think that's missing, yeah. Yeah, there are a few that are not in there. And then this one has, the one from Banner of Truth has 16. So, yeah, that's more than a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 
anyway, so if you that can should get be a, called Grace and Glory Light, <laughs> uh, the other book, you know, a sampling. Yeah, yeah. that works. Uh, yeah. Something. It's different. So um, we're working from. I'm going to be working from the Banner of Truth edition today, looking at uh, page 67, Raboni. Uh, Land, when did you encounter Grace and Glory uh, relative to Voss? Was my first exposure to Voss was the was biblical theology, the book? Did was it the same for you, or did you uh, yeah, enter into his uh, writings through a different venue? The uh, the the two main venues that I entered into Voss through during my time before and during seminary were his biblical theology, which we've been working through, and his Pauline eschatology. And then his shorter writings. Those were the three things that I was reading over and over again when I was in seminary. And while I was in seminary, in fact, um, the the sermons were published. And um, a, a dear friend of mine uh, from seminary gave me a copy of this, and um, it was a it was a beautiful beautiful thing. So I I, I came into these sermons. After I'd gotten into kind of the architectonic structure of Voss's theology mm. and read them in light of that, and that's why I fell in love with this volume, because it is so um, it so clearly and helpfully lets you see what this kind of preaching looks like. Right. Um, and it, it's it's got all of the depth and the spiritual vibrancy of his other works in it, but focused in a special way, because, of course, it, these are sermons. So I came into it on the other side of a lot of his uh, right. other works. I find these to be so beneficial and helpful. And it's also just really instructive for me because our contemporary model of preaching, you can use different hermeneutics. I'm I'm one to say that your hermeneutic does not necessarily dictate exclusively a homiletic. I should just put it this way. A hermeneutic and a homiletic are different things. Now, a hermeneutic may inform the homiletic in certain homiletic approaches or ways of communicating uh, the results of your interpretation certainly could accord better. So not every homiletic right. suits a redemptive historical hermeneutic, but I'm of the right. personal opinion. You may disagree, other people may disagree, but I don't, when we're speaking of redemptive historical sermons, I think there are several ways you can do that. There are different homiletical approaches that could perhaps suit a redemptive historical treatment of a text in various ways. That's maybe a, a question for another day. Yeah, but, that'd be fun to talk about. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an important question to, to ask. Yeah, yeah. Nevertheless, uh, it's interesting to read Voss's sermons and also the collection of John Murray's sermons recently published by Westminster Seminary Press because they do not read like what you would find in, you know, just an average PCA or OPC church where there's a uh, a, a strong, and my my own sermons are this way too. A strong uh, prevalence of you know uh, a structure, number, a listing of points. Uh, you know, mm. naming those points up front. When you get to the point, you know, concluding the previous point and then introducing the next. It's much more rigid. It doesn't have to be. And when a sermon's done well, it flows. But you don't. These read more as narrative prose. Just as just one big point, <laughs> just flows, rather than having these artificial, or not even not artificial, just these sections where it doesn't feel like this is manufactured so much as it was crafted, and, yes. uh, and there's more of a, like an organic motif. Yes. And so to read Murray and to read Voss uh, on in the sermons, to me, it's helpful to transport my own mind outside of my present contemporary context and to realize that a lot of what the way in which we preach today I think is just influenced by the way in which we preach today <laughs> the, yes the context is so different so I wonder you know somebody somewhere could write it this would actually be a good use of the demon somebody could actually write a demon dissertation on you know the the shift in reform in confessional circles from this style of preaching. Yeah, I'll tell you what I think style. Voss and Murray do intuitively, Camden, that many don't do today. Um, Voss is this way. I think Murray's this way. I think um, that th they have a sense for the drama 
of the text for the issues in the history of special revelation that the text press upon us. And when Voss especially here is preaching, he's he understands the central concern of the text. And then his concern is to craft it in such a way that you enter into that narrative, in this case, Mary Magdalene, you enter into the darkness of the tomb, you enter into a context where you're confronted by the resurrected Christ, and then the resurrected Christ speaks a word of deepest and profoundest encouragement to her. By extension, he is speaking to us. And I think Voss and the fact that he doesn't give you an artificial three point, four point, five point, eight point, uh, two point structure is, uh, I think it's that he's not wanting you to hear his structure. He's wanting you to enter into the very flow and concern of the text itself. And I think those yeah. who are developing their preaching as they listen to this should find this as exemplary and a wonderful model right. to follow. Um, but of course, with your point in place that um, you can't tie a homiletic particular, a, a narrow conception of a sermon uh, to be right. the only way that the point could be made. But Well, this boss, style of crafting is more difficult. And I, you get the sense, and I, I granted, we're reading the best of the best. I mean, we're not reading 500 sermons all written within the span of five or six days. Right, you know, it, right. it, 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 he's he's afforded certain opportunities that a pastor preaching twice a week every week doesn't have. Yes. Nevertheless, you're left when you read these sermons, you know, feeling and having lived the text in a way. Yes. Rather than feeling as if the pastor, the preacher, has found out what was in it and reported it to you. Yes, yes, that's yeah. precisely it. It's it's a text that invites participation in the one revealed in it. So that so that the goal here is not simply to understand the three points of doctrinal concern although there will be such points but to be led to fellowship with the crucified ascended and reigning Christ and to be comforted by his personal presence as he makes himself known by his spirit and in his word. And so whatever kind of preaching that facilitates that, we should emulate. And Voss, I do think, is exemplary there. Yeah, I think so. Really do. Well, let's take a look at the text. I'm going to open the sure. Bible here. Got a hard copy of the Bible going old school today in a good way. Very nice. Um, and we're going to be reading the text Uh on the resurrection of our Lord, uh, John chapter 20, I'm going to begin at verse 1, read through verse 18. Uh, the emphasis of uh, Voss's sermon is verse 16, but uh, for the sake of context, we'll read. So here's God's word. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple ran, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping back, uh, stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that, the, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know what it, that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, 
She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. That's the end of uh, verse 18. So, uh, Voss is picking up on verse 16, kind of an apex there and a transition Mm. uh, of Mary Magdalene from sorrow to joy. Yes. Kind of a, a transition from a, an, an earthly and shadowy perspective to a heavenly perspective, which is emphasized by even the angels not understanding what her deal is because <laughs> they have a, a totally different vantage point and can't understand why somebody be weeping knowing what had happened. Um, it's a, just a, a brilliant, um, well, it's the Lord's word, but then the sermon, I think, brilliantly emphasizes the, the greatness of, and the glory and the comfort of this passage that we might not um, that that we might pass over when we just read it, uh, yes, just quickly, yes, and and that Camden that point that you're bringing out, especially the target in verse sixteen, uh, it gets to Boss's entire philosophy of preaching, and we can use this as a wonderful sermon for that regard. If, if, I, if I were to try to put this in context and distill the essence of what Voss is after, uh, what he's after is showing us that Mary Magdalene had a need for the personal presence of Jesus and nothing else in the world could satisfy her. The only thing that could satisfy her is the personal presence of Jesus and the beginning of this narrative is um, very important. She comes to the tomb early while it's dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, if you think yourself back into that context for Mary, um, for Mary Magdalene, as she approaches that tomb, the darkness that surrounds her is um, an emblem of the hopelessness that she feels in her heart because she thinks Jesus has died and remains dead. And the difficult feature, the agonizing feature of the narrative is this, that she remembers Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. She knows that Jesus has said, I am the, in, in uh, John eleven twenty five 25 through 26, I am the resurrection and the life and the one who believes in me, though he dies, yet he will live. And so she knows that Jesus alone is the resurrection and the life, yet she has been cut off from contact with him by death for three days and her coming to the tomb now is really, this is, this is where Voss is so insightful, Camden. Her coming to the tomb is not out of curiosity as to what could have happened to him or to, to just come check in. Voss's point from about 69 through 70 is that she comes to the tomb because she needs the person-to-person fellowship that only Jesus can give. She needs the personal presence of the one who drives away sin and death, despair, uh, despondency, um, and every form of darkness. And, And she cannot find him. Voss hits this, I think, more sensitively than anyone who's read this text and, right. and preached it in sermon form. This is a crisis of deepest spiritual significance to her. You know, she, is, she is, does not have contact with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. He is separated from her uh, in death. And so um, he makes that point there on page 68 mm-hmm. that, that we therefore need a faith deeper than mere acquaintance. It's and it's also of truth. striking the contrast between Peter and John. John being the disciple Jesus loved and the fast one, he makes a point of how much faster he is than Peter without 
Yeah. <laughs> really saying That's it. great. That's great. <laughs> but and and they believed. Uh, they eventually came to understand. But yeah. th- still, there's a contrast and a and a difference in terms of personal need or depth that is striking. And so, what is. the why does this passage exist? That's a that's an important question. Why did the Lord inspire this? Why is it here? especially considering that we have several synoptic accounts of the resurrection. Why is this one this way? Yes. And and Mary's response and encounter with Christ teaches us something that Peter's and John's reaction does not teach us. And their reactions teach us something else. It is, you know, um but Mary needed that personal interaction and she did not run away. But she w- was sorrowful because she needed the Lord's presence and didn't know where he was. Yes, that, that's, it's, it's strange. This is such a strange narrative in the sense that, as you point out, um, they looked in the tomb, went in, believed. They did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. But they believed he had been raised, and they go back to their homes. But the point where the narrative really turns is verse 11. Mary stood weeping. Right. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Now, what's interesting there is is that Voss makes a comment um, that that the nature of saving faith, the character of of saving faith, is is that which seeks Jesus. And and here's the key: doesn't seek him out of historical curiosity doesn't seek him out of an intellectual quest to understand uh, how to state philosophically his persons and natures or something like that, but rather that she is seeking the quickening quality of Jesus' person, to quote from Voss there. Um, uh, I don't have the, the sermon directly before me, but the the living and quickening quality of his person she was seeking the one who could comfort her sorrow in his life and and this shows a really deep understanding on her part of the character of the covenant because the character of the covenant uh, which Voss would make clear from um from psalm 25 14 and other places it is the friendship of the lord where living triune person and all of his immutable glory dwells with a sinful person redeemed by faith and by the Spirit's agency united to Christ. There's a person-to-person fellowship, and Mary cannot rest until she finds that fellowship in the living Christ. And that is just beautiful. She gets, even more deeply than apostles, the essence of of the Christian religion, the essence of what is dawning in Christ's resurrection, and that is his living person exists to glorify God and to meet every spiritual need of his people. And and um, and so she seeks him. And mm-hmm. that is so, the depth of Voss's insight with regard to her spiritual grasp of Christ is just stunning. Mm-hmm. It, it's amazing. I don't think we'd see it as clearly without now what, him. What does it mean? How does Voss bring this out? The fact that she sought him in the sorrow and then also speaking of the darkness and the weeping, that seeking Christ is not just seeking him in the happy moments or or the moments where, you know, we almost don't we we, we might think we don't need him. But he really emphasizes the point of of saving faith and uh, the the kind of faith or the kind of uh, love that Mary had for the Lord in the fact that she did look into that darkness, into that pain unflinchingly mm-hmm. for Christ to yes. find him there. Yes, yes. I, I think what's so important about that is that she is willing to enter into the place of his death. And as she is willing to enter into the place of his death and be identified with him in his death, He will come to her in his life. So here's what's so interesting. Her entering into that tomb is her showing herself to be a true seeker of the person of Christ, such that if he is still bound in the cords of death, I would want to be near him 
even in his death. He is my savior. I, I am a sheep. I hear his voice. I follow his voice. And if his voice leads me to a death like his, I will follow. Now, what's so beautiful about that is as she enters into the darkness of his death, symbolized by the tomb, she sees two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Now, Voss points this out, Kevin, and I think it's beautiful. What does she see? She sees a microcosmic depiction of the tabernacle and particularly the outstretched um, wings of the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant is being imaged here. Yeah. But the divine presence is not the Ark of the Covenant. It is the body of Jesus. John 2.18, destroy this temple. Three days I raise it again. Um, he himself is the unique dwelling place of God so that the people of God, the church, can have communion with God only in Christ, only in the one who is the divine presence of God, spirit endowed, and now raised from the dead. So when she peers in there, um, she peers into the place of death, but what does she see? She sees a she sees a a representation of the most holy place and Jesus' body has been translated out of that most holy place in life. And, and she, she doesn't get it. She, she doesn't understand what has happened because she's weeping. <laughs> if, right. she understood, if she saw the place where Jesus' body had laid, realized he is the new and climactic expression of the most holy place, and that he is not in that cave, he is not in that tomb, he is not dead, but has been raised in the power of an indestructible life, and is now going to ascend and bring his people to that life forever, she would have been ecstatic. But the fact that she's weeping um, is, is an indicator that she does not yet truly right. understand what has happened. Well, she she won't even, doesn't even recognize the Lord at first. And I wanted to pick up yeah. uh, the point of of Mary's willingness to to be with Jesus even even in his death. Yes, because that that's an important lesson for all of us as Christians. Because so many people may want to pursue Christ and they want the benefits that come from Christ, but they don't necessarily want to receive them in the way that God has ordained that we would receive them. The true glory and the the great hope that we have is that we will be present with the Lord, that we will share in his glories, and that we will worship the Lord, the triune God, for all eternity. And we will be present with the Lord, with Jesus, in the flesh, face to face, in glory in the new heavens and the new earth. Yet the way in which God forms that glory in us is through the pattern of suffering unto unto death, unto the cross. And we share in Christ's sufferings now so that we too will share in his subsequent glories. And we pursue that and we endure it for the joy that is set before us, just like the, the Lord went to the cross, even despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. He endured it because he knew of the glories to come in his resurrection and in his ascension and then his session. We do not become Christ, but we are formed into his image, conformed into that image, so that we too bear the bear the form of, of Christ in his two estates, described in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Suffering, have this mind among you, brothers, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He did not count it equality with count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. He suffered unto death. And then through that death then was brought to life and raised in the power of the Spirit so that we too would share in those sufferings, be made like him in his death, and then being raised to heaven. Mary understood that. She didn't understand it, but she had that understanding and that 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 um, inner impulse to meet Jesus even in the death. Yes. And yes. She, then she came to see the power of the resurrection— but so many people, I, I fear, so many of the sheep today, um, when things get tough or when things become inconvenient or when we encounter persecution or trials, nakedness, famine, peril, sword, we want to we wanna sidestep that and avoid it and arrive into the heavenly places 
having passed over the way in which God has planned that we would get there. Oh, brother. A- amen. And t- two things come to mind with your excellent observation, brother. The first one is that interest in Jesus' person and work dominated Mary. She she wanted Jesus. She could not live without Jesus. Such are his disciples. The disciples, the true disciples of Christ say, Lord, where can we go? Only you have the words and the works that give life. So her interest, to put it a different way, is a is an intense religious interest. But it is an interest that's not doctrinally robust yet. It's not as theologically informed as it could be, which leads to the second point, though, that in coming to Jesus, she knew this much that whatever was associated with his death was good for her. See what I'm saying? She knew no matter whether he was raised or not, that whatever is associated with the person and work of Jesus is good for her and to be embraced. And whether we can understand it or not, of course. Exactly, Mm. exactly. Uh, But she wanted to embrace all that is associated with Christ in his death, so that she might embrace all that is associated with Christ in his life because he's one Christ and you embrace the whole Christ or not at all. And, and, and her willingness, I think is moving Camden, the only one who seeks Jesus in the entombed dark sepulcher. Right. Oh, she, it's beautiful. She is entering into the place of death because she is seeking the Lord of life. You know, and this is indicative of her attitude throughout her life. She yes. chose a good portion and, and other, she always wanted to be with Jesus, forsaking yes. everything else. I mean, yes. it, it's, 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 it's a powerful testimony. And she has, it's, you know, a high place of scripture, <laughs> at least, what, at least of, uh, among those born of, <laughs> of man say- and woman. I'm going to say this. This is precisely why I preached this sermon at Grace Mullins' funeral, Mm. and I preached it at my mother's funeral, Mm. because those two women, to me, stand out in unique ways, um, along with my wife, Mm. but stand out to me in unique ways as, as having the same desire, the same religious longing that only Jesus can fill that only Jesus can supply. And so it, it's just wonderful, Camden. You know, I think we could talk about this all day, the more I'm thinking about right. it, how beautiful this sermon is. But yeah, it's, and so for her then in that context to see a reproduction of the, the tabernacle and to know that Jesus though he is the tabernacle presence of God, is not a dead Christ. She starts to, it, that, that starts to become a possibility for her when she sees his body is not there. But she's not sure. So the, the angels ask her, woman, and this is just a beautiful angel, angel question, why are you weeping? If we could amplify that, and, and I know angels um, are sure. ministering spirits sent to serve, but if they were also more pedagogical and a bit more didactic, <laughs> they could have said something like this. Uh, why are you weeping? Redemptive history has been yeah. brought to its omega point. The lamb has been raised from the dead. 40 days from now, he's going to send into heaven. He's going to send the spirit. He's going to raise his people into the heaven temple where they behold his Sabbath, the Sabbath glory forever. And we are always going to be with the Lord. But they don't do that. Well, I um, Voss maybe didn't. I think he intended to, but maybe I'm misreading him. But at least reading this sermon again today raised raised an issue for me on on their dialogue that I hadn't really thought of before. Because I, I think until this morning, you know, I'd read that passage and just see this as kind of one of these rhetorical questions, you know, or, or the, maybe not rhetorical, but at least the angels they they're trying to coax her along and teach her something through the question. So, you oh, know, yeah. So create a question like, woman, yeah. why are you weeping? Yeah. Whom are you seeking? Yeah. But yeah. Voss raised out the issue. And of course, angels are not omniscient. Right. And, you know, Voss seemed to emphasize to me the point that the angels quite literally are perplexed. Yes. Like they don't understand yes. what her issue is. That's precisely like it's, right. it's a genuine question. Like, 
again, this is really uh, maybe <laughs> too crude, but it's question. like it's like woman, like what's your deal? Like I don't, what's up? What's your problem? Yeah, like, true. I think it's true. The purity of absolute perplexity. Right. Like you know, like in in sinless perplexity, they are saying, <laughs> woman, without any humor, why right. are you weeping? They don't get it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's and it's. I think that's a beautiful insight. It's not a a merely rhetorical question, Camden. I agree with you, and I agree with Voss a hundred percent. Um, because coming up on them as they're asking this, having said what she said to them, so in the instant of this narrative, it's almost. Think of it this way: it's almost that the that that Mary's looking at the angels, talking to her. As Jesus approaches from behind, the angels, with him in view, likely, say, why are you weeping? Right. And then Jesus, as she's saying, um, as she's showing her personal devotion to him, I don't know where they've put him, and I want to find my Lord. Voss makes that point. Not just Jesus, not just the Christ, not just the Messiah, not just David's greater son and David's Lord, not just the new Moses, not just the eschatological Joshua. She says, I want my Lord. And so she's telling them, and she's being as honest with them as they're being with her. She says, why are you weeping? And she says, where is my Lord? I want to be with him. That's the most straightforward religious expression almost in the scriptures. I want my Lord. I want his person right. near me. Okay, right. so so immediately then Jesus um, appears to her and asks, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And he gives that pastoral, um, he as the great shepherd extends himself. He asks, knowing, he asks, whom are you seeking? And um, supposing him to be the gardener, still in a, what could we call it? Still in the haze of despair and not yet quite in her right mind, she says, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. And so this is kind, and I will take him away. Now, this is kind of the peak of Mary's confusion, right? She, she, she does, she can't even recognize the ascended, the resurrected, not yet ascended, but the resurrected Christ standing before her. Uh, but she wants him. She's seeking him. And um, she's very focused on that. When Jesus says to her, Mary, simply calling her by name, it is then that in that word, he opens her eyes by his spirit, working through his word. He opens her eyes so that she might see him as Rabboni, as master, as teacher, as the living Christ. And and what Voss does with this Camden, I, I just find so so precious. And I, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to communicate it as well as yeah. Voss does without reading long sections. But let let me try to put it this way: It's not just that Jesus is Rabboni teacher. It's not just that he has revealed himself to her and illumined her understanding. When she says Rabboni, what she is saying to him is something like this. I greet you, my resurrected teacher, my resurrected Savior, my resurrected Lord. But I greet you not only in that way, but as the one who alone has turned this darkness into light and this weeping into joy. So what when she says Rabboni, it is infused in, a, it's a single word summary of the worship that she offers yeah. the ascended Christ in a, a spontaneous and effusive burst. Right. That's the, that's the best way I know how to get at it. Foz is so much more poetic than that, but that's where he's going But with don't it. we see also... You know, in this single word, uh, her name, when he says her name, the transformation 
occurs in that powerful moment. It does. I would give almost anything. I mean, I, I, I hope I can ask my Lord face to face one day or ask Mary the, the tone of his voice when he said that, mm-hmm. you know, and it's one of those things you could, you could, you could read that, you know, what do you say, Mary? Probably not. Yeah. He, would yeah. he say it in a tender way that he used to address her? Whatever the reason, the tone of voice is what transformed her. But there's, it's no, no, it's of no small consequence that it's her name that the Lord yes. speaks her name to, and, and, because there's there's a lordship and dominion aspect to that as well as just a, a great you know personal tenderness and relationship in speaking somebody's name to them someone that you're you're intimate with you know yes, yes. that and, it, it it's tremendous and then that's the moment of transformation it's not yes. sight uh although that also is significant in the bible but the naming the lord's naming and you think also of peter right when he when he says to the lord you know remember me you know when you go into your glory and we, we the lord you know has is not yet ascended but now he has been raised from the dead has he forgotten his people? No, but he's still the shepherd, the shepherd of the sheep, and the sheep know his voice, and he knows them by name. Yes. Now, that right there, Camden, that is the deepest covenant theology in the Gospel of John. Um, and and what I mean by that is, is this, that when Voss in the Hebrews, the epistle to the Diatheke on, on page 186, when he's talking about the essence of the covenant, He says this, he says, to be a Christian is to live one's life not merely in obedience to God, nor merely in dependence on God, nor even merely for the sake of God. Listen, it is to stand in conscious reciprocal fellowship with God, to be identified with him in thought and purpose and work, to receive from him and give back to him in the ceaseless interplay of spiritual forces. And so when Jesus calls Mary by name, let me, let me try to say it this way. It is the beginning of the consummation of the covenant relation for her. She is being called personally and tenderly and sovereignly into religious devotion to Jesus where he receives her worship, she gives her worship, and there is mutual and reciprocal uh, uh, bliss in that relationship and and speaking to her by name shows you the depth of the person to person fellowship bond that lies at the core of the covenant and what does that covenantal fellowship bond between god and man reflect that intimate eternal and incommunicable person to person um, dwelling in one another among the persons of the trinity the perichoretic glory of the persons who are fully god is, is what underlies that. And so in, in this, Jesus is giving her the deepest religious reality of the covenant because he gives himself to her and she knows him as he knows her by name. It's just, yeah. it's just beautiful. It's the heart of, of our, our religion, mm-hmm. really. Um, yeah, well, these are passages that are so rich. And, um, you know, people read this, and you may hear an Easter sermon, and then you may hear a sermon that, you know, really starts to go through all the factualness, the historicity of Christ's resurrection from the dead, missing sight of really what's what's most important here. Of course yeah. Jesus rose from the dead. If he didn't physically rise from the dead, if that didn't really happen, then we're of all people most to be pitied. Yes. Uh, and we have no hope. Amen. But— if that's all we preach is the the historical fact, the the uh, denotation of the resurrection, without the connotation, and more than that, without without the love and the covenantal aspect of it, and the yes. eschatology of it, then we've also missed missed the passage, and that's why I'm so thankful for Voss and the way he treats this passage. Oh, it's it's so good. Now, Kevin, if I could just wrap up, I I preached a sermon that's designed to complement Voss. Voss focuses on the wonder of Mary when she says Rabboni. I did a sermon, Foss uh, develops this, and then I tried to develop it more. So l- let me just give you the, the uh, just uh, our listeners, just a very quick treatment of the do not cling to me 
language. Oh, please. Yes. Very That's very um, theological and important. <laughs> yeah, it's so theologically important. Jesus stops her from her embrace. She does not cling to Jesus, and you would expect Jesus to allow her to do it. After all, she's the only one who's been seeking him. And after all, she's the first person, human being, to whom he appeared after he was raised. So this is huge. You would expect Jesus to say, Mary, cling to me. Of course, I am here. I am your redeemer. Um, please cling to me and lay hold of me, and I will bring blessing and life and glory and peace and comfort to you in your affliction. But instead, he says, do not cling to me. And the reason he gives must be understood, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. What does that mean? Well, Jesus, remember, in John 16, 13 through 15, says that when he ascends, he will receive and send the Spirit. So the Spirit, after he ascends, will come. That's the language of Pentecost. Jesus will rise, ascend, and he will pour out the Spirit on the church. John 14, 2 through 3 in, in the Gospel of John says that, in my father's house are many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be with me also. That's a reference to the heaven temple. That's a reference to Sabbath rest, what ultimately will be the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is saying, I'm preparing a place in heaven to bring you where I am. So here's the logic. In order for him to bring Mary to heaven, Jesus must ascend to heaven yes. and send Mary the Spirit. Yeah. And so when he tells her, don't embrace me, what in essence he's saying is, if you will wait in 40 days, I am going to embrace you from heaven. I'm going to give you the Spirit when I ascend to my Father, and he will be the permanent, glorious bond of our union. He will produce um, in you all that is pleasing to God and through the Spirit's agency working in the gospel, I am going to prepare you for glory and bring you where I am, where on the last day I summon you by name from the sleep of death and bring you bodily, body and soul into that place I've prepared for you in heaven that you might see my glory. So what he's telling her is if you embraced me now, that embrace would be broken by death. But if you yeah. wait and I embrace you from heaven by the spirit through the word, that's an embrace that death will only further and advance well, because I think that, that it, sort of thing. I think that's absolutely correct, but I think it's even more than that because Christ, having accomplished redemption, still had not ascended on high, which is an, an important part of his messianic ministry. And so exactly. for Mary to embrace him would have— you know, the symbolic effect of clinging to him to hold him there. Yes. And he, you cannot have even a resurrected Messiah on earth. You have you to cannot. have a resurrected heavenly Messiah to enter into and intercede at God's right hand forever and ever. He, she would have, this wasn't necessarily her heart's intent, but the embrace, what Jesus is making a point of is that he must ascend Otherwise, we're, we're halting or truncating, as, as you've said elsewhere, the history of heaven. If, if I do not ascend, Mary, you do not ascend in me and with me. Right. So do not cling. Yeah, his work must reach its fruition. It would have been a sub-eschatological embrace. It would have been. <laughs> and, and so what he's saying, a different way of putting it is Hebrews 8.1, the main point of my ministry, Mary, is that I must ascend and be a high priest in heaven so that I might bring you where I am to right. see my glory. Amen. And that is just, it's just so robust. So I hope our listeners find this useful. We'll get right back to Voss. And by the way, that that material on Voss that we'll be looking at, I think it's of in, enormous uh, right. theological importance. So the, I, I can't wait to uh, see the extra it. month's wait, I think, will be will be well spent. You can read ahead and, and study up on it. We'll talk about that. Prophecy, Doctrine of God, how it relates. Oh. Oh, There's yeah. a lot to speak of there, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, thanks so much, Lane. I think this was this was timely, important. I was uh, spiritually blessed myself reading this in the passage and then speaking with you about it, and I hope our listeners Beautiful. were too. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm encouraged too, brother. Thank you so much for your labors.
Likewise. Uh, right. We want people to check us out online. Uh, you can follow up at reformedforum.org. There you'll find information, of course, about all of our programs as well as how to get in touch with us. And a lot of exciting things going on. If you'd like to, to contact us, uh, if you'd like to follow up somehow, um, we do have uh, uh, ways to get a hold of us and a uh, lot, lot to talk about. So I'm around, got a bunch of trips going on. Uh, if people are going to be at the Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary Conference coming up in March, I plan to be there, plan to be exhibiting at, uh, at a table. Just got back from uh, the uh, conference, the faculty conference at Westminster Seminary, California, I'm planning also to be at the the um, Together for the Gospel, that we will not be having a table. I'll be around if you'd like to connect there, uh, OPCGA in June, um, and several other trips. So there's a lot going on this year, and I'm going to be uh, around <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> so uh, that in conjunction with different video courses that we're working on and some publications, it's a busy year. So pray for us and encourage us and uh, check us out online if you can especially at reformedforum.org slash donate. We're really encouraging people to uh, continue not only to support us with one-time gifts if you're able and willing, but also to consider perhaps uh, some monthly contributions because those are really the lifeblood of our organization, financially speaking. We know that the Lord provides, and uh, we want to continue supporting the church and uh, God's people by producing and distributing theological resources along these redemptive historical lines. And... Uh, and uh, this podcast, as well as all of those resources, are able to exist and to be distributed because of uh, the generous gifts of our supporters. So thanks so much. We're online at reformedforum.org. I want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Central.